example, the chancellor, the pro-chancellor of the Dayananda Sagar University and my own administrative colleagues, the technical team headed by Ms. Deepa, Mr. Ali, Mr. Mohammed, and other teams of the, the techniques here, and my dear, the national and international participants of the, the important, the international webinar, ladies and gentlemen. So it's an important day for us to debate and to discuss the, the issue regarding the COVID-19 and how it's related to the reinventing agriculture to achieve food security. And which is the topic of the international, the event today. Now, over to Ms. Deepa, madam. Ms. Deepa, madam. Ms. Deepa, madam. Over to Deepa, madam. Mohammed? Yes, Deepa, madam. Hello. Hello. Am I audible, sir? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. You are very much audible, madam. Okay. We can be able to hear. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to all the participants. On behalf of Dainan Sagar University, I welcome each one of you to this webinar. Let me take the privilege to introduce our convener, Professor Dr. Muthu Chellian. Dr. Muthu Chellian is a world-renowned biology scientist with more than 30 years of teaching and research experience at different hierarchical levels, including Professor head and chairperson, vice chancellor. Currently, he is serving as the pro vice chancellor in Dhanan Sagar University, Bangalore. He obtained his doctoral degree from the School of Biological Sciences, Madurai, Kamraj University, Madurai. Subsequently, he had postdoctoral research from the University of Akona, Italy. He has been conferred with prestigious Doctor of Science in recognition of his research accomplishments on biomass research management and technology. He has been conferred with several fellowships from prominent foreign and Indian scientific societies, including International Energy Foundation, Canada, National Academy of Biological Sciences, Zoological Society of India, National Environmental Studies, Academy and Indian Applied Association of Microbiologists. He has guided 81 students for research, four scholars for postdoctoral research, and 43 candidates have been awarded PhD under his supervision. He has three decades of research experience with more than 30 research projects with leading international and national organizations. He has published more than 220 research articles 25 books, 42 book chapters, and more than 500 popular scientific articles in leading SCI journals and magazines to attain his H index 23. Notably, he has authored four books of Uyir Virman, Biodiversity, Current Status and Management in Tamil, Biodiversity, Conservation for Sustainable Management, Perspectives in Plant Biodiversity, and Glim Glimpses of Animal biodiversity. And these books were graciously released by Honorable Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, former President of India, and His Excellency Dr. K. Rosai, Governor and Chancellor, Government of Tamil Nadu, and widely appreciated by peer, peers of scientists working in scientific arena. Besides, he was also involved in steering committees in 12th State Planning Commission 2012 to 2017, Government of Tamil Nadu and expert of Puducherry State Higher Education Council 2014 to 2019, Government of Puducherry. He served as chairman 
of NACPUR team visits in many institutions across India and active member for different panels and committees in UGC, DST, and MNRES. He has received 40 prestigious international and national awards to his academic credentials, including the first Indian scientist honored with the prestigious award of University of Ancona, Italy in 1998, Lifetime Achievement Award in Environmental Science, Lifetime Achievement Award in Food and Nutritional Sciences, Lifetime Achievement Award in Microbiology, twice the Merit of Excellence Award, Eminent Scientist Award, and the 76th Indian Sci Science Congress Endowment in Natural Sciences. He has brought in academic and administrative reforms for vibrant administration and rig rigorous academic initiatives. During his academic positions at various levels, such as vice chancellor, pro vice chancellor, registrar and controller of examination in charge and coordinator for universities with potential for excellence, total grant of rupees 40 crores member in syndicate senate and academic council at higher education institution. So a warm welcome to you and over to you. Thank you, madam. Thank you for your uh, the nice introduction. Uh, let me have our, uh, the presidential address of this, the international webinar on COVID-19, the reinventing agriculture in, uh, in uh, achieving the food security that was the current, the topic we have taken today and reinventing agriculture to achieve food security. India had a large and diverse agricultural sector accounting on average for about 16 percentage of the GDP and 10 percent of the export earnings. The India's arable land area, which is nearly 394.6 million acres is the second largest in the world after the United States of in, I mean, America. So it's cross irrigated crop area of nearly 82.6 million hectares of the land. Again, it is the largest in the world the, of the total scenario. So India is among the top three global producers of the many crops which includes wheat, rice, pulses, cotton, peanuts, fruits, and vegetables. So worldwide, as of now, India had the largest herds of buffalo and cattle. Again, is the largest producer of the, the milk and as one of the largest and fastest growing of the poultry also uh, in the Indian subcontinent, the ongoing the ongoing health issues of the COVID-19 today has affected all walks of life today. And during these challenging times, how does Indian agriculture respond to the crisis? And how do the government methods, I mean, affect 140 million farm households across the, the India and thereafter the impact of the, the economy of a very important uh, country in the, the developing world. So we assess the, the immediate, the challenges of the COVID-19, which has posed to the farm sector, the agriculture sector, and uh, suggest the mitigation methods to ensure a, a sustainable food system in the post-crisis, the period of the, the COVID. So India to home to agriculture, as I mentioned, in self-sufficiency of the, the food production to suit the, to the need of the nearly 140 crores of the, the population in India. And currently we have of nearly 2,177 kgs of the, the crops production. And then also the cereals, we have nearly 2,981 per hectare yield currently to suit the needs of the our Indian population. So despite this, the statistics, there is a huge potential in India to increase is the agriculture productivity to meet the food requirements of its growing 
population. The good uh, news is that the experience in India and like other countries shows the adoption of the sustainable farming practices. Sustainable farming practices can increase both productivity and reduce the ecological harm. So, so here, the sustainable agriculture techniques enable the higher the resources efficiency that help to produce the, the greater agriculture output while using the, the lesser land, that means water and energy, ensuring the, the potentiality and profitability of the uh, for the farmers of the, the India. So this essentially includes methods that among the other things protect and enhance the crops and the soil and which altogether improve the, the water absorption and use efficient the seed, the treatments. So while the Indian farmers have traditionally followed these, the principles, new technology now makes them to be more effective. So the other, the perpetual the challenges of the India's agriculture is the availability of the, the water. So here the many food crops like the rice and sugarcane have a high the water requirement of this so in, in India. So altogether, Indian farmers have long experience in the water conservation that can now be enhanced through the, the technology. So next is the seed and how can be treated and enhances the, the production in terms helping the and improving the root system to absorb the, the water, the nutrients and etc. So here the Indian government, the high budget have been for the sustainable cropping patterns and more technology are primarily have been given focus in by the our central government. So the government of India is implementing sustainable agriculture practices and policies under the national mission for the sustainable agriculture we call as NMSA. So the government is supporting the effective use and managing the our agricultural land yeah, for the, the higher production. So here the government is disseminating information regarding the chemical fertilizers to optimally use and ju judicially use. And we have been switched over to the organic form of the agriculture system in the Indian subcontinent. So according to the agriculture cooperation and farmers welfare of the government of India, the government is foreseeing the future risk of the, the climate change. So the climate change related to the agricultural, the challenges in India have been mainly focused here. And even though we have the major challenges faced in the agriculture in India is number one is the crop season shifting, the temperature alterations, the increased requirement for the, the irrigation, especially the water, and then over exploitation of the groundwater resources and declining organic matter in the soil. And finally, the multiple plant nutrient deficiencies. So in addition to the all the above the challenges, what we have been fa facing in the Indian agriculture system, we assess, we assess the immediate challenges of the COVID-19 as posed to the farm sector and suggest the, the mitigation measures to ensure a sustainable food system in the, the post-crisis period. So yes, a lot of the studies have been, I mean, concluded that nearly 10% of the, the farmers could not harvest the crop in the post, I mean, month, they, and 60% and of those who did the harvest to reported a yield also have been increased because of this, the problem. So here, the impact of this on the second flesh is not yet known and after the co, I mean the post period of the COVID-19. So the entire, the Darjeeling tea and the tea based on the tea industry will be significant fall in the, the revenue that also we have, I mean, we have been seen in the, in the industrial and then also the plantation crops. From 20th April, under now the lockdown, I mean guidelines to reopen the economy and relax the lockdown, 
they are our agriculture business such as dairy the tea coffee and rubber plantation as well as associated shops are been industries have been reopened and all together for that so here the indian council for the agricultural research icar has issued the the state wise guidelines for our farmers to adopt the the sustainable agriculture in indian farmers and all together also we have been cautioned in nationwide and then also the international focus will be the food security we call as the hot spots that includes the fragile the conflict affected areas where the logistics and distributions are i mean difficult even without the morbidity and social distancing have been also been focused so now what we have been frequently frequently have been facing is the the immediate challenges so what is our immediate challenges of the the covid situation so in spite of all these measures and in view of the continuing the restrictions on the movements of the people and vehicular traffic has been raised regarding the negative implications of the covid pandemic on the farm economy so this is the peak of our the rabi season in india and crops like wheat gram and then lentil mustard all including the paddy in the irrigated tracts are at the harvestable stage of almost reaching the the maturity so this is also the time when the farm harvests our the market yards for assured the procurement operations by the the designated the government agencies so moreover any separate i mean any separate on the severe disruption to the supply of the the perishable fruits and vegetables dairy products fish etc having mobilized to meet the the increasing demand from a bulging of the uh, the middle class as well as the urban and rural consumers of the the indian subcontinent so we have a lot of the problems have been facing now because of this covid situations so as are now going to the, the lockdown we coincides with the the rabi and the harvesting the season the farmers across the country look out the government is ensure that uninterrupted harvesting of all these crops in a smooth way and the procurement also been taken care by our the state and central the government so now we have to take a mitigation measures so the poor sections of the society are always are the, the hardest hit in any disaster or the pandemic situation so with about 80% of the indian farm households being small marginal farmers and a significant part of the population being landless farm the laborers welfare measures to i mean contain any damage from covid are definitely going to help them with sincere implementation so we have taken care for that so the focus of the government therefore has to be protect the the lives of the every citizen in india so here the people living on agriculture and other allied activities mostly those losing their income from the informal employment at this lockdown period have to be provided with the alternative avenues till the economy bounces back to the normal situation so all together we have been taken well care for that there has been also not only in india in also to the global concern that the speculations on the restriction of the exports of the agricultural commodities by a few global the players having taken role so india being trade surplus on commodities like rice meat milk products tea honey horticultural products or etc may seize the opportunities by exporting such products with a stable agriculture export policy in india so many the climate models have been predicts the the favorable the monsoon in the 2020 season the indian meteorological department has also taken officially announced that and we have taken well care of the 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 harvestable of the our agricultural products so good news is that the government of india has now increased its focus on the the nutrition the security of the raising farmers income rather than enhancing the farm the productivity so here the changing 
the consumer behavior with suitable programs and incentives is already in the agenda of the central government. So for all this to happen, the existing landscape policy incentives that favor the two big, the stable of the wheat and rice has to be changed. So designing the agriculture policies post COVID scenario must include these imperatives for a food system in transformation in India. And, and the recent problem also have been focused. Another one is the locust. So it's similar to the grasshopper. The World Bank is also working with partners in the United Nations and national governments to deliver immediate and long-term support to respond to a crisis within a crisis. A crisis, I mean, in the pandemic and also we have a locust the problem, the worst, as I mentioned, the locust outbreaks in the, the decades and which are currently in focus of the, the Indian agriculture. So our support will help the hot hit farmers and rural commun communities control the locust swamps, withstand the dual crisis of the COVID along with the, the locust and get money into people's pockets and equipment into farmers has to recover, including the, through the cash transfers and the, the folder packages and etc. So with this, the future smart agriculture practices in India will definitely will be taken well care of in the COVID situation. So we conclude as we propagate climate smart agriculture practices in India, few and the last mile delivery mechanisms need to be strengthened. Analysis and scaling of such measured, the sustainable agronomic practices should form the benchmark for conveyance of the schemes in this area, immense future relevance. So especially for the small and the marginal farmers. I hope soon we will recover from all these situation, our Indian agriculture, not only the Indian agriculture and also the all the global agriculture and I mean the agriculture practices will be unstable and which will need to the suit of the sustainable way and for need of the human society. So with this, I would like to conclude my the presidential address in this important event on the reinventing agriculture to achieve the, the food security. Thank you, thank you one and all for the patient hearing. Next, the talk of this event is the keynote address. The keynote address by Professor Dr. David A. Neary. Professor David A. Neary is a professor of arboriculture and oliviculture in the Department of Agricultural, Food, Environmental Sciences at Polytechnic University of Marche, Italy and he had PhD in Applied Tree Physiology in 1991 and MS in Pomology in 1985 at Bologna University, Italy. He was research scholar earlier at Mexican State University, USA and visiting professor Global Agriculture School of Tokyo University, Japan. And he delivered the very good the knowledge of his horticulture and agriculture to various countries, countries which includes Brazil and India too. Professor Neri is broadly interested in the, the precision farming, then agroecology, root physiology, and sustainable fruit orchard management. He has authored more than 300 journal and technical article, and he is a member of the National Agriculture Academy, International, Indi I mean, Italian, and Japanese societies of the horticulture sciences. He served as the fruit expert in FAO and delivered the training courses in several fruit production areas in the world and former director of National Fruit Research Center in Rome, Italy, and the director of the experimental agriculture farm of the uh, presently at the Poly, uh, Polytechnic University of uh, Marche, Italy. And now over to Professor David Neri. You are most welcome to deliver your lecture on the 
the precision, the agriculture farming system. Thank you. Over to Professor David Neely. I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mutuchelian. Thank you for your friendship and for your ability to prepare a very, very interesting meeting, international meeting, webinar for everybody. I would like to thank also to the participants that are around 200. And uh, I, I know that there are also some friends from around the world. So I really appreciate this uh, opportunity to speak with you about uh, the possibility to use agriculture. And now I'm sharing the screen. Okay. Almost ready. Okay, you see the the, the presentation. As, is everything okay, Mutshelian? Yes, everything is fine. The time Hello. allotted is for you is thirty minutes. Yes, and a couple of questions from the participants. Okay, so again, thank you, Professor Mutshelian, to invite me to make this uh, introductory lecture. And thank you to the other uh, professors that will uh, uh, make the presentation. And uh, thank you to all the people that are uh, participant to the meeting, to the webinar. So first of all, that we have to, to thank also the, our, the university that is hosting us, so Dayananda Sagar University in Bangalore. So uh, I will give some information about the possibility to use fruit production to increase the sustainability of our agriculture. And uh, I started to give the opportunity to, to have an idea of what is the real plan for a uh, European Union about agriculture. So agriculture is inside the great European deal uh, about the green economy and uh, it, uh, as a big goal to make the uh, uh, European Europe continent uh, climate neutral by 2050. So that is uh, that means that we are looking for sustainable and uh, inclusive growth strategies, and uh, this includes the possibility to to improve quality of life of life and uh, people health, but together with the care for nature. So that is a, 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 a big goal and to leave nobody behind. Uh, so what is the, the, the Green Deal for, for Europe now? It's a, a strategy now that is uh, including the strategy farm to fork for agriculture. And this is a, is a part of a, a way to make a circular economy, most efficient food production, better storage and package, healthy consumption for people and uh, more sustainable processing and farm transport and then better informed citizens. That is a key part of the, of the project. So make more and more information to the uh, people. So this uh, farm to fork strategies is um, it's something that uh, like to improve the quality of the food supply chain and build an integrating uh, framework in which we can work. So generally speaking, this as, is a plan that uh, needs for action and uh, to build the food chain that can work from the farmers up to the consumers and they're respecting the climate and the environment. Then we have to work about the transition. So it's a, it's a part of, of the game to, to discuss about the transition. So I would just give some uh, in, information. So transition for us means that uh, we have to reduce the dependency of, on pesticides. That is very high at the moment. In, and uh, we use a lot of antimicrobials. And uh, we 
have to reduce excess fertilization. So that is a, a, a key point for our approach now. We have to work increasing organic farming and uh, uh, use at mass, as much as we can the biodiversity. And so to reduce this biodiversity loss that was very, very, very high in the last 50 years. So ultimately we are trying to make our uh, Europe uh, climate neutral by 2050. Just to give an idea, that is a very, very old olive tree. So this tree is uh, 1,800 years old. And that is our root. We have a, a, a possibility to work with very, very traditional farming systems that are still in our countries. But this is almost impossible to be sustained on the economic point of view. It's very costly, the labor. And so what we have to, to work on, we have to go on. And that is the, the, the way, you know, new orchards that are with more uh, uh, efficient trees, but that is not enough. As you can see, these olives are very marvelous, but on the right, you see that we have a risk of a soil erosion. We have high labor cost because the trees are still very high and with very low efficiency in the pesticide and fertilization use. So this group of negative things are, are uh, uh, making us uh, with the not possible cultivation in this way for longer. So, but we have in, inside these some very positive uh, uh, information. So this is a very resilient species, is a very high productive, has an equilibrium between fruit and, and production that is resilient to the uh, climate change. So what is the opportunity? Try to work with the, the traditional uh, varieties and make the propagation of these, try to improve the quality with new technologies. So that is the first big goal of the transition. We have to work together with the tradition and the new techniques. We are not afraid of the new techniques if we have a good knowledge of the physiology, of the resilience of the species and the capacity of the species to make the production. So here you can see the propagation in vitro for, for uh, uh, olives, the, the greenhouses, and then the plants that go to the fields. Go to the field with a new way. So this is uh, the olive orchard now in my university. That is, I'm taking care of this orchard. And you can see that there is hill, there is the soil that is covered, is almost fully covered, so we don't have any risk of erosion and the possibility to work with the trees that are with a very uh, a nice uh, uh, architecture and they can be arrested using the uh, mechanical arresting system over the row. So here again, you can see how these new orchards are implemented using the traditional varieties. And here is a test fi trial field with well, different ancient varieties. Okay. 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 I have some noise. Please, you follow me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Roma, just you can mute the, the okay. other disturbances. So, if we go in this way, we can even work with mechanical harvesting systems. And you can see that uh, uh, now we are able to work with, with ill sites and uh, mechanical resting systems that can harvest very rapidly and efficiently these trees that are more similar to bush, but with the same genotype that we had in our very traditional variety. So that is uh, just an example of a case study in which you can see that we can introduce novelties, innovation, technologies on the very traditional way to manage the 
species and the varieties maintain the genetic resources that we have locally and on the same time uh, defend the environment against erosion and pollution. So that is a very, very uh, nice example of what we can really make a sustainable food system and uh, bring together environment as social benefits and obviously economic gains. So the opportunity to have a real sustainable approach. <clears throat> and uh, this is also very important that give some uh, sustainable livelihood uh, to the primary producer. <clears throat> so uh, we uh, can also have the possibility to work with COVID-19 pandemic situation. That is uh, uh, for us uh, a very good example because in Europe for this pandemic situation, we did not stop the uh, agricultural activities. <clears throat> so still the farmers uh, can work in the field. And so we didn't stop any any production at, at the moment in Italy. And uh, that can be a good example of what we can produce in a robust and resilient food system. Uh, I will give you some ideas, then I go back to, to COVID. So the, what was the big change in Europe in, in uh, the last 50 years? It was globalization and urbanization. So agriculture, were uh, driven by these strong and uh, uh, forces that are, were, were uh, managing the development of this agriculture. The population uh, uh, became very, very lower in agriculture. Now is a very small percentage, maybe it's two, three or 4% of the population that live in, in the countryside. So this globalization is something that is important for us because we know that we can't increase uh, arable land more than 5% in the next few years, or even we will, be, we will have some loss over or, or, or arable lands. So, but we will have an increase of population. We can expect in the world, you know, almost 10 billion people in, in the next, uh, 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 30 years. So uh, that it, it is, will be very important. And uh, this is also the other key point, urbanization. So 60, 68% of the people that will be in the cities. So we, we have to face this. And if the people live in the, city, in, in the cities, at least in Italy, what happened for fruit consumption? So fruit consumption is uh, something that is quite important, but is different depending on the age of the population. So people that are uh, older, they use, you know, less, uh, 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 they, they are a low number, but they increase the fruit consumption. And this is something that uh, is also uh, very, very, very important. And uh, you can see here, young generation up to 17 years old, they consume less fruits but if we go to uh, the old generation, both women and, and uh, male, it's increase is uh, very, very, very strong. So we will have a consumption that is in fruit production is increasing depending on the age. And uh, is increasing also depending on the different way of life. So actually we use more and more fruit at breakfast that was not our tradition. Our tradition was to use a lot of fruit at lunch, but actually the uh, European market is going to uh, use more the fruits for breakfast and, uh, you know, for snacks, for snacks. So when we have, uh, uh, during the day, just 15 minutes stop, we eat some fruits. That is uh, something that is changing a, a lot. The type of production to, to give fruits to, to this very changed way to consume fruits. And uh, this is also very important that you see that fruits 
are, are becoming very, very, very important as a side dish where, when we have the, uh, 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 the main meal. And uh, uh, this main dish is, is becoming still important, but we use less and less fruit as a dessert. So these are quite important numbers that we have to take in account also because we have a population that generally speaking is, is, is overweight. So we have to change our habit and we have to change our habit according to the way to manage our day, day life, you know? And so if we eat fruits in the morning, fruit must be easy to prepare. Mm -hmm. It must be tasty. It must be uh, uh, something that can be easily cons consumed. So it means that uh, uh, it's becoming very, very, very popular now, the use of berries and bananas. So easy fruits, easy peeling, is, or you can eat or the fruit very, very easily. So it's changing completely the, the way to consume. What happened during this period of lockdown? The period of lockdown was uh, almost three months in the cities, not in the country, as, as, uh, in countryside, as I told you. So during this lockdown, what was the, 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 the consumption of fruits? So the consumption of fruits in quantity increased by 18% by the people. So they stayed in, uh, inside the, 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 the apartment, the, the houses, and they used more, more fruits. So they changed the habits. So they were more and more keen to use healthy fruits, healthy diets. So it made a very, very big change in using the fruits. They increased the fruit and the, they spent more money for fruit in comparison to the others. So uh, uh, what it, it will be the, the, the impact that, you know, it's, it was a, a possible to, to have a consumption that it will maintain higher the use of fruits in comparison to the other one, to the other fruits. So it will be more than 50% that will use very high consumption of fruits. So during the lockdown, what was the tendency? Just generally, you know, I, we did some questionnaire in, around the countries and the, the different situation. So what increased? Increased a lot the consumption we are uh, we are web internet so it is very very uh, important now that all the families uh, uh, buy on the on the web and uh, also they are collecting fruit uh, 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 by by the the delivery at home that is a big change because we were more keen to go to the supermarket or to big shops to buy fruits but now we are able also to have uh, fruits at home directly. So uh, what, what does it mean is that it means that uh, uh, some of the farmers, they were organized and uh, there is a, a, an application now in the web in, in my region here in Marche region, that is uh, Manja, Manja Marchigiano. This means uh, that you have to eat food from Marche and this is uh, 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 it got a very high success. So a lot of farmers now, they are cooperating in sending the food directly to the houses of, of, the, uh, uh, of the consumers without any intermedi intermediation. So that is an opportunity for our agriculture to make more income and in comparison to the uh, way to traditionally were used that people produce and sell to a, 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 a retailer that will give to the, far, to the consumer the fruits. So, and the, again, fruit, vegetable uh, are, are increasing a lot. And uh, we have a decrease, obviously, of all type of, of consumptions that were out of the house. And uh, what, what is the, the, the tendency that we expect for the next six months? So for the next six months, that it will be again, a very uh, in big interest by the consumer to uh, go through Italian produce. 
and uh, using traced uh, supply chain. So we, the consumer likes to know exactly where the fruits are coming from and mainly from local and territory. Then it still is a very important for, for, for the consumers to control the, the price, to have price that is, that is uh, not very high. And you see here a big increase in organic farming. You know, for the people, 30% of, the, of them ask, ask to have more in the next uh, uh, six months, more organic fruits. So that means uh, a very strong increase because generally speaking, the consumption now of the organic food in, in Italy is around 5%. So it's not very high, but the possibility uh, that uh, this lockdown changed the perception that we need to have production that is more linked to the quality of the environment increased the perception and the of that organic fruits is a good solution for this. So 34% is a big number. And then uh, also we are very interested in healthy food with a, a lot of nutrient uh, capacity. So nutraceutic capacity and so on. Then we have obviously the circular economy. So we need to have sustainable packaging and the transport and so on. So if we go again to general issues, so just to, to finish, it's, it's lockdown and COVID for the agriculture could be an opportunity to go on more sustainable approach. So we can accept innovation and this innovation is just technology, is just to make, you know, production soilless and so on. So this is uh, the way to produce uh, uh, strawberry in soilless culture is possible. We can do, we can control almost everything, but uh, it's not allowed in organic fruit production. So these, these uh, uh, strawberry will not be organic. And I think that is very important that we have to think that this is a way that is uh, uh, possible in Europe to produce but is not linked to the big deal of having a more safe environment. So that is strictly is something that requires a lot of control by and energy. So I would say that it will be not sustainable at all. So, uh, and also we have a problem to face that this is, is reducing completely biodiversity. So in this, almost sterile environment, we have the opportunity to work with maybe one genotype, one clone. So that is not an opportunity to reduce the climate footprint or the global transition to this more organic situation. And is maybe is a new opportunities, but it's not very resilient. So it's an opportunity that require too much energy. So, Another way is to work with organic farming. So organic farming now is, is a very popular in a different country. And you can see here a big uh, orchard that is or organized in Poland uh, pro for, to produce apple. And here is a, a production that is outside the European Union, but is very close, it is Armenia. And uh, it's, it's a, a way to show that it's possible to produce in organic, situation in a good climate condition. When we go through organic production, we have to be careful to change our mentality. And so if you can see this picture, you see that here there is a plastic bottle. So that is a way to say that if we don't change our way to manage the environment, it's not only the possibility to use organic production following the a European law that give you this uh, opportunity to, to, to make to, to put this certificate in your production. This leaf is a symbol of organic production in Europe. That is very important if you are able to manage pro, to manage properly the production and the uh, 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 the soil and the biodiversity. But you have to forget to use uh, 
some kind of uh, plastic without making the proper circular economy. So another big issue that we have for modernization is that is that productivity, the paradigm that is dominant. So it can be the, the only way to solve, to have higher production per hectare. You know, that is a big problem actually, because you know, with the globalization, it's much easy in some cases to uh, import and to use logistic and to have some new uh, produce from outside our country. And uh, 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 because it is less expensive to buy outside than to produce inside. And uh, you can see here, that is a trend from the last, you know, maybe 15 years. And you see that the uh, possibility for Italy to import is, is increasing. So we are importing more fruits in Italy. That is one of the biggest exporter in Europe. So you can see that we can export, you know, almost 3 billion of euro. So it's a really a huge amount of, of money that are exported in, in Europe by Italy about fruit and vegetables. But on the same times, we are importing more. Globalization means that we are importing now from India pomegranate. We are importing from India uh, table grapes. We are importing from India, you know, mangoes. So that is uh, the, the side effect of globalization. We are very interesting in produce a lot, but on the same time, the consumer is, mar is very far from knowing where is coming from the fruits. So we, it's the, the consumer is uh, buying more and more fruit from different countries. So what we have to, to work on we have to work on the knowledge and so the, the possibility to say to the consumers what is really a traditional local variety, what is uh, this uh, fresh produce that they can have. And so it's, it's a way that some big brand and traditional and, and innovative are using now to work with local varieties, to work with territories or to work with environments as a claim for the quality of the fruits. That is very, very important. Sometimes they use only trademark. And this is a big, big deal now that is a club of varieties or trademark. So they, they are uh, trying to organize the supply chain uh, up from the, farmer, from the farmer up to the consumer trying to give value, but it's not really, really uh, easy to make this. So only few brands, only few trademark were able to make this. So uh, is uh, the organic uh, fruit production able to, to face all these kind of, of, of problems? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, yes, it's possible. We have a good legislation, a good regulation. It's a little bit bureaucratic, but uh, the sector is credible now. And so the production is very, very increasing. And you can see here the, the increase of organic operators along the years. And you see that there are very, very huge number of people that are certified as organic in Europe. And this means that we have in Italy at the moment 430,000 hectares. So it means that in our uh, possibility, we have more or less 12 million of hectares that are cultivated in Italy. Of these, uh, 400,000 4, are for fruit, citrus, grape wine, and olives. So all the orchards that uh, I, I'm studying on. So we are going to work the, studies of introducing the technologies in the orchard. So this is organic apple production that is inside the research project that we are managing from, from Ancona in several European 
station. Here is uh, Switzerland, Feeble Center, and you see the possibility to have very, very different species and uh, useful insects and uh, uh, living mulch that can help in managing. We can, uh, the, the, the soil and the fertility, we can manage the canopy and the, the, the fruit covering using plastic that is recycled. And so it's possible to, at the end of the cycle, to get back this plastic in, in the industry. So the sector is, uh, is having evolution and is getting money for the farmers. So that is very, very, very important. And then give a, a, a boost in the production, in quantity and quality. And we are really going through a sustainable approach this is another uh, or, um, research project that uh, we are managing in Ancona about the uh, uh, soil management and uh, um, fruit quality and, and the resource genetic for peach, cherry, and apricot. This is a big pro project that is about the possibility to work with uh, the fertility. So fertility for us is something that is in a general model far from natural condition, when we work with monoculture. If we go through crop rotation, we are a little bit better. And so that is, can be stable in the, during the, 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 the year, but we are trying to go with our fruit production more close to mixed crop system, like agroecology, agroforestry, that can be very, very important to create diversification and in this diversification, we can have the humus formation. So that is our general model. So for us, now it's becoming very, very important to work with living mulch. Then we consider these herbs not as a weed, but as just a part of our biodiversity. So this is the project is around Europe and it's working using different strategies. So we cover the soil with different species that can be very helpful like Fragaria or like uh, Tagetes or like Mint. So we can use several species and we can use recital organic amendments and to improve quality and to use also microbial based product for plant nutrition and obviously some plastic cover, but with the capacity to manage the circular economy of these plastics. So this is a, a new way to design the orchards with several sandwich systems that are able to increase the possibility for the root system to work. So that is a give the key of our uh, um, studies are the, the roots and the, the way the roots they use the niche inside the the, and, and I give you just inside the soil, I give you just some few pictures that give an idea. This is the peach, the fruits that are, uh, uh, you know, you see that there are some allelopathic control and they don't mix each other. So we can study these and we did several experiments with, with uh, uh, several species in this case, with uh, the uh, roots of uh, strawberry. And you can see when you have some residues of the strawberry plant, you can't have a good behavior of the root system. So without uh, the strawberry residues, you have a much better root growth. And so we are also an impact on the, on the quality. This is the same for apple. And uh, we did with several species. And uh, this is uh, with, uh, with olives and a very nice experiments that I would suggest to make in everywhere, everywhere in the world is what are doing the root system when they can work in different niches. And so that is a very key point because you can have a, the tree that are able to explore different soil and different possibility to use compost or substrate that are toxic for the root system and so on. In this case, with the wall pot or in just half of the sectors in the pots. And this is a very simple result. When you have all the roots with, with uh, different problems, like, uh, you know, allelopathic residues, so self residues, resi residues of uh, the same trees, 
you have a big problem. You can even die after this. So these are days after transplanting and you see that these uh, 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 plant did not grow. But if you put the residues in only a part of the soil, the plant can grow and even get an advantage from the organic residues. So use the residues with a model, with a system that is able to use diversification and the possibility that the root system find the nutrition where they can use this. This is a very nice example that is a root system, a, a, a olive, and you can see that the application of, of the compost is from the two sides in a small part. And after a few months, we got the roots where we applied the organic compound without disturbing the rest of the soil. So it's a real big opportunity to work with sustainable approach for fruit production. And I really thank you for inviting me to give this lecture to your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor David A. Neri for the excellent presentation, how the fruit crops can be used in a sustainable way. And then what are the various practices that you have been doing in your uh, the Mediterranean region, uh, especially for the, uh, the crops like uh, the apple, strawberry, and, and so on. And uh, before, uh, I mean, asking the others, uh, for the questions, let me have uh, two clarification, uh, Professor Davide. Yes. Can I react? Can I react, Professor Davide? Yes, I'm ready. Yes, uh, number one, the clarification that is there any disturbances in your export of the apple and grapes as of now due to the COVID 19 situation? Yes. There was some problems to export, mainly by uh, uh, airplane. So uh, the, 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 that was uh, almost stopped for these three months. But the others uh, exchange were not blocked. So we were able to export to uh, North Europe almost all of our production. So really, there was mm, uh, not uh, a, a, a significant production. Okay, uh, then, then number, uh, the second clarification that uh, almost uh, in Italian situation, uh, that also I, I have worked uh, in experience uh, with you. And uh, do you think that the present farmer system will change and more towards to the mechanic system furthermore? Yes, yes. Uh, in our social situation, I think that we need to go farther in mechanization. And, but these mechanizations should be uh, thinked in a, a sustainable way. Because if we use just mechanization, we destroy the soil. But if we use mechanization in organic farming, so we can have the advantage of the technologies and on the same times, the advantage to maintain biodiversity and soil quality. So that is a, the big deal for the future. And so also uh, Dr. Arash will present this, this approach. So it, it includes technology inside traditional way to manage the soil. That is uh, the, the key point for the future. Yes, thank you, thank you. Any any questions or queries from the participant side? One or two? Any clarifications or questions from the participant side? I have a, a, a question in, in the chat. I, I can uh, do this. Is from uh, Professor uh, Bayravi. Yes, yes. Bayravi. So if uh, the COVID-19 pandemic substantially inhibit or induce increased full crop production by farmer, uh, 
yes. uh, in this cropping season. Okay. season. And that is a very, very interesting uh, question. You know, I, I appreciate this because, uh, you know, we, you, you have to think that this big change that we have in the society and we had in this period will not be, an, a, 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 you know, in the same way for everybody. So what is, you know, some good friend of mine got a very big success in organize the direct selling to the cities. So they were able to increase the fruit production of this season and the fruit price of this season because they were able to organize by themselves the, uh, the, the uh, uh, selling of the fruits directly to the cities, you know. But other uh, uh, produce went down completely, you know, because they were not accepted anymore uh, by the, the, the farmers. So we had some decrease for some cheese, you know, some cheese were blocked because they were not able to go up to the, the, the consumers. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that is, uh, is changing the weight of the different production. And remember that in this period, the people were uh, keen to have healthy fruits, healthy food. So it was uh, really incredible. In three months, people changed from the already prepared fr uh, fruits to make themselves at home some new preparation because it was, uh, you know, like a, a fashion to create their own bread at home, their own uh, specific food at home. So it means that if you were able to produce some flour that were good for this uh, new uh, way to manage the, the food at home, uh, you have increased the, the, the production and the price. On the other hand, if you don't meet these new tendencies, you are far out. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Davide. So at the outset, uh, on behalf of the Dayananda Sag University and part of the uh, participants, uh, we really, we are very much, I mean, fascinated to hear your lecture. And really, it was fruitful. Since you presented about uh, the fruits, so it was fruitful. The lecture you have delivered. Thank you so much, uh, David. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mutujani. I, I just wanted to, to say something about uh, uh, Dr. Santil message. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, please, I, please, please. I, yes. I, am, I am really happy that he is proud to be. Uh, uh, a uh, big uh, researcher on, 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 on the field. So he's telling that organic farming system in India is not new, is uh, being followed from ancient time. Yes. And uh, I really appreciate this. Yes, yes. You, mu you must be proud of your technology. It's yes. not, it's a really important technology. And uh, you, Professor Mutuchelia, know yes. very well yes. what is the compost technology and, and, uh, and uh, yes. what is important for, for the system. So yes. it's, uh, to keep soil alive and good health. That is yes. uh, something that I really appreciate. So yes. I, I think that for us in Europe, we have to learn a lot from you. Yes, thank you, thank you. In India has been traditionally, we have been using the compost as one of the source for the our nutrients to the many crops, not only fruit crops and also for the, the vegetables, cereals, pulses, and so on. Thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Davide, for your excellent lecture. Uh, next to move to our uh, Dr. Arash, Dr. Arash Gosravi from Iran, and uh, he is currently working on the sustainable management of local alu production by using precision farming system and development of the territory the University of Polytechnic della Marche, the Ancona, Italy, and uh, Dr. Arash and his master's in uh, the food and beverages innovation and management from the University of uh, the Marche, Ancona, 
are under the the Florida scholarship. Then again, regarding is one more master's of the degree in the entrepreneurship management uh, from Tehran, Iran, and he has his bachelor's degree in the agriculture engineering, and he has a very vast experience in the field as the research manager in the University of Applied Science of the, the Tehran, Iran, and then also agriculture engineer. And, uh, and yes, I think he has a vast experience both in the conditions of Iran and uh, Italy, uh, such a, a personality is with us. And I think he's going to deliver on the, the precision, the technology in the, uh, the farming systems. So let us welcome uh, Dr. Arash Goswami. Please, over to Goswami. Hi, hello. First of all, thank you, Professor Mutuchelian, for inviting me. And also, thanks for your supporting teams in Dayanda Sagar University that gave me this opportunity to take part in this seminar. Also, as I want to say hello to participants and also followers on the YouTube. Let's start. Dr. Harash, you will be given 20 minutes for your presentation. Okay, I try to do this during this. Yes. Okay. Uh, I am PhD, uh, PhD student of the sustainable management of local olive production by Precision Farming System in Ancona University. And my tutor is Professor David Neri, and I want to say thank you from the Marjorie, Mark region that sponsored me to uh, doing this PhD. I want to have uh, some glance in 20 minutes on the precision farming and fruit precision farming. Let's start with the definition of the precision agriculture or precision farming. Precision agriculture and precision farming uh, have the same meaning and have been used alternatively. Generally, precision farming is modern farming management concept that using uh, technology, digital technology to monitoring and optimize agricultural production while minimize the environmental impact. On the other definition, the new and ongoing agricultural revolution in information technology called precision farming. It's address challenges of the tailoring management to site, crop, and environmental traits. And it promotes uh, something new, technology and data, and address uh, heterogeneities of the field. As you see here, for instance, on this picture, if we imagine that our field, our orchard is heterogeneous and we be able to do some kind of tailor management on it, we can reduce amount of the input and we have higher output. This is a one uh, main things that we can obtain from the precision farming. On the other hand, there is a other kind of category for precision farming and precision agriculture that they didn't put these two together as an alternative, but the definition is the same. At this time, we have the precision land management that divide in precision uh, forestry, precision aquaculture, and precision farming. Under the precision farming, we have the precision agriculture and precision animal husbandry. But the general definition of the precision agriculture and precision farming is the same. Using the technology as a management concept to improve our yield as a and also minimize the negative effect on the environment. Okay, let's look at this, that why we need precision farming. Because precision farming address current challenges of the agricultural sector. What is these challenges? We need high quality and high quantity product together. On the other hand, we want to reduce negative effect of the agricultural sector, for instance, environmental pollution, loss of biodiversity, greenhouse emotion, as a sustainable way. 
when I talk about sustainability, my means is that uh, sustainability that is based on the three pillars of the social, environmental, and economical base. So precision farming can address all these challenges together. Moreover, precision farming enable big farms to tailor management as a smart farms do. And it's uh, not exclusive to specific kind of farm, but it's applicable and beneficial for all farms. For instance, we can do on the small farms, large farms, organic farms, conventional farms in developed country, underdeveloped country, and something like this. But generally speaking, I would like to mention that precision farming is not panacea, but it has a great, great potential to let us to have a sustainable development in agricultural sector. Let's have a look in some challenges that we are faced in the precision farming. As you can see on this schematic picture, for precision farming, we need a lot of data that we should gather from all around the world. Also, gathering data needs a necessity to the technology. And we also, in some country, we have infrastructure limitations that suppress us to do this procedure. Moreover, it's economically infeasible for medium and small scale farms to applicable this precision farming system. Sometimes we have a lack of knowledge in some part, for instance, in the farmer's part, we have some lack of the knowledge to, for implementation of this technology. Lack of the sophisticated operators is the other problems and needs of accurate model for decision making is one of the most and biggest challenge. If I want to explain something for you here, as you see, all the data comes and gathering to here and here we have a owner, owner of or supervisor of the farm. Here the data comes and supervisor and owner should be able to use some kind of decision making systems or use some decision making to, uh, to know that easily what we should do with this data. Okay, I have a data of the uh, weather, water, water stress, everything, what we should do, how I can manage it. Here we have the role of decision making and we should work on it. On the comparison or on the components, we have some solution for these challenges. We have easy to use devices. So if we can reduce the, uh, the necessity to the knowledge to the specific part of technology. Also, we have economic devices that is easy to buy for uh, medium and small uh, size of the farm. And also we have portable network that we can use, for instance, in some area that we have a lot lack of in, in infrastructures. And we have a, we can create a service platform for farmers to pay whenever they need. So with these things, uh, more we can develop our uh, precision farming system. And the main and important case in this regard uh, about the solution is development of the models for decision making. This is a role of the uh, agricultural engineering or agronomists to develop this model because technology grows so fast in the future, maybe for at the precision farming, we can be able to uh, manage each plant or each tree separately, but we should develop the model for making decision to do this. Generally speaking, to go deeper than most of the recent research and development on the precision farming focus on the management of the crops. But we need also precision orchard management. Maybe this part precision orchard management is a little bit difficult that we have a less of a improvement in this regard, but also this is necessary and we should do investigation on this. As we go a little bit deeper to go to the, our topics, generally we have precision agriculture, under precision agriculture, there is an area of precision horticulture. In the precision horticulture, we have precision orchard management. Okay, 
now we are on the orchard inside the orchard we want to do precision fruit management by using the technology so we want to implement technology to use a precision fruit management as a some way we want to do smart fruit management application of the technology for management of the fruit uh, as a some sustainable way Generally speaking, about our strength in the precision fruit farming, to give you some uh, general view, we are able to monitoring, monitoring everything in the field, such as trees, soil, disease, weather condition, and the fruit. Moreover, we are able by technology um, doing the agricultural operations, such as irrigation, spraying, soil operation, also, we are able to do fruit detecting. And nowadays, we have the more accurate and precision harvesting systems in some area, but in some areas, we should develop it. And we have technology to post harvest. So, this is a flu chart, or this is a way that we can manage a precision management of the fruit. For categorizing the technologies on the other ways because it is, it's necessary that you know that okay when you want to use the technology in the field or in the orchard uh, how how is the category category of the this technology or how we can use this technology for doing this you should be able to understand the level of the technology first of all we have a satellite technology we have also unmanned aerial systems such as camera lidar systems. We have tractors and vehicles, but especially we want to talk about the autonomous tractors in this area. We have crane or slider or frame installations. Also, we have stationary logger with, with cable or radio data transfer that eventually with wireless network especially from this all of the ocean of the technology i works on the dendometers so this this uh, you, you should know that uh, you should know that which in which part you want to work and how you want to manage generally i works on the, the endometers and the, the future and the, the case study that i explain is come from this area of the technology about the technology that i put on the farm and use the data and collect the data that uh, continuously I uh, can get from the orchard. My work is to monitoring the fruit con grows continuously. I do this by the continuous measurement of the fruit grow as a some kind of the management. This is a, this kind of the study Having, has been investigated on a lot of study, for instance, on a lot of fruit, peach, grapes, kiwi fruit, sweet cherry, pear, and the olives. I work especially on the olives uh, and the marker region. How I can do this or how I can implement the, my study as a, some kind of precision fruit management on the orchard? As you see on the right picture, this is a dendometer that installed on the farms. It's, this is a Frantoio variety in, in, on the marker region. I measure continuously the transversal diameters of the olives to have some kind of data. And this uh, dendometer is uh, completed with the other part of the experiment that you see on the left part. It's a, a photovoltaic battery, data logger systems, and also we have a, a time-lapse camera to monitor the olives. Uh, all this data gathered 24 hours, 24 hours and continuously during the period of the fruit grow, for instance, from pit hardening to the harvesting time, we have this data to the to manage better the uh, fruits or manage better the fruit management. Okay, until now it was technological part. So is 
technology grows and give you a lot of data, a lot of information. But for instance, in my case, the result of technology part is this graph. From now, it's our duty to understand, okay, what is this graph? What this graph is speaking about this? Or on the sum is it speaking, I should translate this graph, this behavior, to the something uh, physiologically meaningful for the tree, for the for my work, for the olives. These two graphs, as you see, the blue one and the red one, are for the frontoyo olives, and you can see we have the, some fluctuations on the graphs. As a general speaking, to give you some knowledge about these fluctuations, fruit grow is Olive fruit grow is uh, followed by double Zygmunt grow curves, but generally, as you see here on uh, fluctuations, in the morning for the, for the olives, we have the shrinkage of the fruit, and at the night, we have expansion of the fruit. This shrinkage and expansion continuously uh, uh, goes away during the period of the grow of the fruit, and we can see this kind of the uh, this kind of the graphs, but also you can see that in the some part of the graphs there is not uniformity as other part. Or for instance, in some area like this area, the, the graph that doesn't does not follow the previous part. So this is our role. That this is our uh, rules, our duty to understand what's happened here. Why it's like this? This is not just for the uh, especially olive fruit. Also for the other kind of the fruit, we can have this data and we should be able to translate this data according to the special parameters such as biotic, abiotic parameters. But the general and common challenge with the plant-based sensor is to relate their output to physiologically meaningful parameters in a consist of the matter. So at next slide, I will tell you that what we can understand from the continuous monitoring of the olive fruit grow and in which part I want to uh, develop this area. First of all, first of all, the main outcome of the fruit monitoring, especially olives, is that it gives us sensitive water stress indicators. In my opinion, monitoring of the fruit in the olive is the best sensitive uh, water stress indicator. Why water stress is important for us? It has a direct impact, impact on the fruit yield, vegetative growth, and in some uh, quality of the olive, such as, for instance, linoleic acid content in the olive oil. Linoleic acid is uh, one of the essential polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acid. When I say essential, it means that our body are not able to synthesize it. We should observe it by diet. The level of the linoleic acid in the olive will be decreased by the water stress. And so on, if we be able to monitor and control and manage the water stress in the olive, we are able to have a more high quality uh, product. The second thing that we can understand is applying regulated deficit irrigations, or we call it as abbreviation RDI. Regulate deficit irrigation, as general speaking, is the precision irrigation management that we do for our field as a way that we reduce the amount of the water that we use without any negative effect on the yield in the case of the quality and the quantity. When we do RDI by monitoring the fruits, that is a good uh, parameters for this, also we can achieve the olive oil yield, olive oil quality, and accelerate fruit maturity. It's obvious that it's economically also for us interested because we can reduce amount of the, losing the water. 
The third things that we can get from the monitoring of the olive fruit grow is that it give us more accurate fruit load determination in comparison with the traditional ways that we have it. In this way, we have more uh, fruit load determination and it's, it's so important for as an economic way for farmers nowadays. The four and five uh, main outcome is ripening and harvesting. Why I put these two together? Because the ripening and harvesting are twist together. Uh, maybe when you have the optimum ripening time, it's not optimum harvesting times and vice versa. When we have the optimum harvesting time, it's not optimum ripening time, but we should manage it and balance it as a way and but the, by the monitoring of the fruit, we can do this. For instance, ripening the stage of the fruit has direct effect on the harvest quantity rate or olive fruits and olive oil quality are directly related to the ripening and harvesting. The other things here that I want to explain is about the, some parameters. Oleic acid and linoic acid were significantly influenced by harvesting time. Previously, I explained uh, linoic acid for you and on this, on this uh, previous slide. About the oleic acid, I want to mention that oleic acid is a, is a parameters that we use for uh, categorize of the olive oil as a extra virgin olive oil or virgin olive oil. Not only this is important as a case of the nutrient, but also it's important as a part of the economy for the economical part for our, for us, also for the farmers. Because if you be able to produce extra virgin olive oil by precision farming, you can sell your product more uh, expensive or with a better uh, price. So it's, it's helped us as an economic part of the development. The next things that I want to explain is about the monitoring, monitoring of the olive fruit grow is a good estimation of the fruit size. According to some research, we can have an estimation of the fruit size and why estimation of the fruit size in, is important for us easily because it's the, some things that directly affect your market because maybe you don't produce oil just for the oil sometimes you eat it on the table or, or also for the other kind of the fruits such as apple we can have a good estimation of the fruit size for the apple also by monitoring this and it is a direct effect on our marketing and economical effect. The, ne the next and the last slide that I want to explain here is the new concept of hysteresis. Until now, during these this six uh, main outcomes that I explained, I, he was also able to get this from a lot of uh, articles and from a lot of uh, research. Some researchers did an investigation on this. But nowadays, we are working to the other concept that means hysteresis. Hysteresis it means is lagging behind. It's a phase angel difference between input and output time series. As you see at the uh, left down part, we have a loading and unloading. But the pattern that the loadings go from A to B and the unloadings comes back from B to A as a starting point is a different. So we call this phenomenon hysteresis. In the, I should mention that this is a rate dependent hysteresis. Hysteresis is ubiquitous and have been used in a lot of uh, 
part in agriculture, also in the other science, such as physics and magnetics, uh, and sharp flow in the magnet in electricity in a lot of this, but about uh, application of the hysteresis in the agriculture. For instance, we have a research that show us the hysteresis on the canopy conductance, as you see at the uh, right top part, we have the conductance with the D, D here is the VPD or water pressure deficit that you can see here, the blue part of the graphs show us the hysteresis. And as you see, it's the clockwise hysteresis. The down part also show us the same phenomenon, but now here the comparison, the conductance of the uh, canopy by the temperature, as you see again, it's the uh, hysteresis and clockwise hysteresis. There is a lot of parameters that affect the hysteresis and the generally about the magnitude of the hysteresis, shape, uh, clockwise, unclockwise, there is some um, biotic, abiotics, and uh, maybe genetic parts about the trees are important that you have a different kind of the uh, fruit grow graphs. And according to the different fruit grow graphs, when we have the, uh, when we want to analyze it, we have a different uh, uh, hysteresis graphs. And generally, this was some brief uh, preview about the precision farming and precision food farming during this uh, 20 minutes. I was I uh, try to give you this, some uh, general clue and some informations. Thank you for your attention. And also, I put some references here that I used to create this. Uh, presentation and if you are interested uh, I can share it with you. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Arash and uh, I think you have given a very uh, good experiences with the precision farming system with uh, especially for the aloe uh, tree I think uh, fruit you have done wonderfully and uh, what I Two questions are the clarifications from participants, Dr. Harash. Yes, uh, I, is, is there any question? First of all, I try to uh, come, I try, I am trying to do a very fast presentation and I compact it to have some time to maybe have a discussion with the, some participants and or some, some followers. I will be happy if there is some question in this regard. Anyhow, Dr. Harish, I think uh, uh, you are, I mean, email ID is with the, with the participants. If any questions or any clarity is there, I think they will directly write to you. And I think you will be most welcome to answer or clarify for those questions. So on the behalf of the, the participants and also on behalf of the, our Dayananda Sahar University, I very much thankful to you for your Thank excellent you. uh, the seminar you have given. Uh, Thank you so much. Thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Mutuchelli. And just Thank for you. the final sentences, I want to like that, uh, as Professor Neri said, we want to use a technology as a, some sustainable way to improve our agriculture um, or chart management without any negative effect on the environmental environment as a sustainable way this is our goal i hope we can be we be able to reach this yes definitely definitely because you are you are instrument no that is the ten, uh, tendometer and the extensive yes. meter no that would be very useful to know the growth of any fruit not only alif fruit and also it can be applied to any even tropical fruit even tropical fruit we can use it i think our friend uh, professor uh, armugam I think you use this technology uh, for especially we have our tropical fruits, mango, and then papaya, and the other fruits are there as a tropical fruits. I think we can very well use your technology to know the growth of the, the various fruit size and etc. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arash. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. And shall we, are, shall we go to the next, uh, uh, the, the lecture? 
Uh, today we have a very the eminent person, yeah, and again, he's a horticulture scientist, Professor Dr. R. Mugam, the Dean of the Horticultural College and Research Institute, Pariyagulam, comes under the uh, affiliation of the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University. Professor R. Mugam completed more than 32 years of service in Tamil Nadu Agriculture University as a teacher, as a researcher, and an extension worker in various capacities in the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. Uh, he was formerly also the Dean of the Yemayam Institute of Agriculture Technology, Trichirapalli, again in uh, South India as a researcher. He involved in release of uh, six varieties in vegetable crops and one flower crop and developed 15 production the technologies, uh, innovative technology he developed, including year-round production of the chrysanthemum, a good flower. And then he mobilized funds to the tune of nearly uh, more than two crores uh, to operate the various the funding uh, the schemes to the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University. And he published more than 310 research, popular articles in peer reviewed the journals and international journals, besides 22 books. Out of that, 14 are with uh, ISBN. The publication scored nearly 377 the citations with the index more than uh, 20. And he had a very good uh, the, uh, the laurels and credits. And he guided 12 MSc students and seven PhD scholars in his career. He organized uh, more than 20 training, uh, the workshops, seminars uh, under the ICR, Indian Council of Agriculture Research banner. And then he was the instrumental in uh, creation of the facilities, the library, the indoor stadium, auditorium, and then molecular, the laboratories, and then vertical farming, and then faculty, and then although uh, again, automatic seeding and uh, grafting units. So such a, a versatile personality is with us to deliver the lecture on the topic called emerging trends. Emerging trends in horticulture to compact hidden hunger during COVID-19 pandemic in India. Over to Professor Armuha. Uh, sir, good evening for a nice introduction. Uh, and I uh, good evening to Dr. Neri, Dr. Arash, and uh, Dr. Ramani Bai. She is going to deliver a lecture next to me. And uh, good evening to all my friends who are viewing this uh, international webinar. So uh, I am going to, I mean, they talk about the the trends in the uh, horticulture. How best uh, we can uh, increase the production and productivity of horticulture crops. Uh, which can able to so which can able to uh, eradicate or prevent the hidden hunger uh, the two are hidden hunger as well as the covid are interrelated when there is a strong immune system it is automatically resist the virus entry so when you solve the problem of hunger particularly hidden hunger so we can we can develop the uh, immune system, which is fight against the, the uh, any type of virus, particularly the COVID virus. I hope there is no need for uh, introduction about the COVID virus. We have already, uh, I mean, uh, read so many uh, hundreds of pages about the uh, COVID virus. Uh, this is the latest figure in India, how the India is affected very mostly. And today's figure is around almost 3.5 lakh people, 3.95 people, almost 4 lakh people are infected, out of which the death rate is almost 12,000, 13,000 people uh, is died of the corona infection. Coming to the, the hidden hunger, so we all know that uh, India is one of the uh, high, thickly populated or highly populated country. So we're almost uh, uh, 130, 32, uh, crore people are living. Uh, though we are producing huge quantity of food grains, vegetables, fruits, everything, 
but still uh, we we are uh, undernourished as far as the i mean the figure shows that uh, in uh, 2016 so we are at the 97th position uh, among 118 countries indexed uh, worldwide so almost 48% of the uh, children which are below 5 years of age are stunted almost 60% are anemic and 70% uh, consumes less than 50% of daily recommended micronutrients so this is the concern in the uh, uh, big country like india so how we are going to uh, address the issue so you can see the figures so now in the latest survey uh, in 2019 almost 32% of indian children going to be standard by 2020 so this is very alarming figure so in the cities you can see the cities in the, almost 62% of children are uh, malnourished or undernourished so the lowest is the bangalore and the highest is the uh, chennai and you see the figure so the rest of, we were in a good position in 2014 is almost 17% uh, of our people are under uh, uh, hidden hunger so now 2019 we crossed almost 30% that is in the serious category so this is the issue so we have to address or the scientific community or the policy maker so um, really they have to uh, put this little effort and energy and also draw plans how best we can uh, eliminate the hidden hunger and we can develop a good indian citizens so this is the biggest challenge before us okay so what is the what is the uh, solution for that so we have to give a nutritious food no other go so one is the variety of cereals legumes fruits and vegetables animal so foods and fortified foods so among all the things the fruits and vegetables uh, contribute a major nutrient so which can eliminate many of the are uh, many other elements say for example so there are many elements which are present in their fruits and vegetables so particularly zinc vitamin c iron vitamin e vitamin b6 and vitamin a so these are abundantly present in the fruits and vegetable and this gives the immune system uh, boosts the immune system of the human human body which can work against or which can fight against the any kind of virus in the system okay now what is the role of the horticulture crops particularly the fruits vegetables spices uh, in the uh, human nutrition system so though we need the huge quantity of uh, this one uh, carbohydrate protein it's are very much needed but we are very much needed is the vitamin and minerals so these vitamins and minerals are abundantly present abundantly available in the fruits and vegetables our famous uh, 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 dr m s swaminathan in his quote due to rich content of vitamins fibers minerals antioxidant horticultural produce holds great nutritional significance he says horticulture alone can solve the problem of malnutrition undernutrition and hidden hunger problem in india so now of course though we are growing almost all the crops the tropical to temperate fruits and vegetables and there are certain uh, underutilized fruits and vegetables which contain a lot of the Uh, immuno boosters or all, all our vitamins and minerals so particularly you can see the the manila tamarind the bale custard of oil guava utapil so these are the fruits which can able to improve the health of the health status of the human being and also alleviate malnutrition and incidentally it gives an additional income to the growers also so these are some of the uh, fruit crops which can have a lot of uh, nutrients so which can able to alleviate the the malnutrition or hunger nutrition uh, problem so likewise there are 
plenty of vegetables which are normally we are not i mean the uh, giving importance and these vegetables which are locally available which contain lot of vitamins and minerals so that needs to be uh, given importance and we have to sensitize the uh, population sensitize the uh, rural folks uh, in order to eat these uh, unknown or underutilized vegetables okay now the problem is the urbanization it is not alone to india the entire world is uh, facing a problem why this all this uh, under nourish malnutrition and spread of many disease now we are seeing the spread of this is only in the cities either delhi or mumbai or uh, chennai because of the thickly populated place and due to urbanization so the, all the problems are coming including the hunger and the include the hidden hunger so you see the the figure so you see almost all the uh, uh, continents the, there is a sharp increase in the uh, population growth uh, in the urban areas you take india india also there is a there is a uh, yeah, uh, in 2015 it is almost 38% of population lives in urban urban areas whereas it is estimated that in 2050 it is almost more than 50% of indian population is going to live in urban area there the land is a problem water is a problem sanitation is the problem there thick population it also leads to poverty so the poverty means then automatically the hidden hunger or the less of food that will cause us the huge problem uh, to the society you see this is a effect so you see the the red marked ones are the urban uh, population so in uh, 2011 out of 6.6 billion people almost 50% of world population is lives in the urban area in the 2050 it is estimated that almost 60 to 70% of the population it's going to live in the urban area so coming to the so how we are going to address the issue so only through the production and productivity of different cropping either fruits vegetable or spices or medicinal plant and due to sustained efforts due to sustained research uh, contributions by the uh, scientists all over the country we have developed a lot of technologies which end up with uh, a fruitful results that is by increasing the production and productivity so in 2004 and 5 uh, we have produced nearly uh, 166 or 67 million uh, articles of fruits and vegetable or articles of produce in total from an area of 18.44 million hectares you can see in 2018 uh, 1718 within uh, there is a, a sharp increase in area of 7 million hectares but you can see the uh, total production of almost 311 or 312 uh, 12 million metric tons of fruits and vegetable or articles of produce which we can almost in 12 to 13 years period we have jumped into double so this is a great achievement uh, in the production and productivity in order to meet the growing demand of the fruits and vegetables so coming to the what are the different uh, uh, contribution of different group Uh, among horticulture crops around 60% contribution is from uh, production is from vegetables 31 from the fruits and uh, uh, nearly 6% from plantation crops and 2.6% from spices and flowers is comes around 1.2% uh, okay so this is a, this is the yeah, yeah, fragmentation of how the different horticulture crops are giving the um, uh, total contribution to the total production of horticulture crops in india now you can see so this is the scenario of when we compare to the agriculture or cereal crops so we in 2001 and 2 the agriculture production is agriculture means the or cereals pulses uh, legumes uh, and oil seeds all put together it is around 213 million metric tons in during those days the horticulture production is almost 140 million uh, metric tons 
So now you can see, so to the tune of almost 17 to 18 years, we have almost, we have almost doubled the, uh, more than uh, doubled the articles of production and the articles of production is surpassed the agriculture production uh, from 2011-12 onwards. So this is a great achievement. And another thing is, so there is a great demand from the public uh, for the fruits and vegetables because of the uh, high uh, income generation, high surplus income available. So that will lead to the uh, a high um, level of uh, purchasing power of the people towards fruits and vegetables. So now the, uh, the problem before us or the demand before us is, so the present production is almost 312 uh, million metric tons, uh, whereas in the fruits and vegetables alone contribute 282 million metric tons. When you want to satisfy the 360 gram of fruits and vegetables on daily di dietary requirements to the growing population of uh, by 2050, we need to produce we need to produce minimum of 450 million uh, metric tons of fruits and vegetables. And when you add the processing as well, as well as the export demand, we need to produce almost 540 million metric tons of fruit vegetable by turn of 2050. So how to achieve this? So that is the biggest challenge before us. We need to double the production and productivity of the um, horticulture, particularly uh, the fruits and vegetables. So in order to, in order to, I mean, satisfy the, the minimum per capita availability of fruits and vegetables of an individual. So this is a one. And number, another thing is we want to safeguard, we want to achieve the, achieve the uh, health or nutritional security of the people also. So that is more important. And another important thing is there is a growing demand for the medicinal crops and food crops and a lot of awareness among the people about the, the healthy food, uh, either fruit, vegetable or medicinal plant spices for all this. So this all amounted to a huge demand for the uh, different crops. So we need to focus this 2050 uh, and to achieve almost uh, 540 million tons what are the strategies by which we are going to achieve this target? So that is the biggest uh, uh, challenge before us. Okay, so now how we are going to achieve this one? So there are different strategies, different technologies by which we can achieve this. So in the case of fruit crops, uh, we all know that it is very difficult to uh, horizontal expansion of area and the less resource, particularly water resources, because the declining monsoon and there is uh, no further expansion of dams and other things, it is very difficult to achieve the expansion of area horizontally. And another important forcing problem before us is the labor scarcity. So these three problems poses us to go for a, an alternative technology in which we can go for vertical production. Vertical production means without increasing the area, how best we can increase the, uh, the productivity from an unit area. So that's how, so we are designing different uh, uh, strategies uh, to develop this. So one of the strategy is the high density planting or ultra high density planting in the fruit crops. And the another important thing is pruning and training is another important thing. So we have to do it and the fertigation is another method by which we can increase the yield. Then in the case of vegetable crops, so we are, we are in the process, we are already doing the precision farming, protected cultivation, vertical farming, hydroponics, vegetable grafting, moringa, microgreens. These are the uh, probable strategies uh, which can give you, or we can design, I mean the uh, available before us to achieve the production target. Then the another important area is the spices and medicinal plant. It needs to be uh, cultivated organically. And also we have to enhance the production and productivity through the protector cultivation. So that is an another uh, important area to achieve this. So we all know that the, our traditional production system, so we are getting very uh, low uh, yield. Say for example, 
so in the case of mango so our production level is uh, it's al almost 15 tons per hectare 15 tons per hectare from the normal system of planting so but which is not uh, going to uh, serve our purpose so in that if only we are going for uh, adapting the HTP high density planting or ultra high density planting. So that means we are going to reduce the area and through continuous crop canopy management and continuous pruning and training and adoption of lot of fertigation and the plant protection system. So by which we can maximize the, uh, the uh, productivity in a unity area. So this is you see the so the, this is the older system. And this is a newer system. So we are reducing the plant spacing and row spacing and between plant spacing. You can see the crop, how profusely it is flowering. So likewise, in every crop, we have the technology, either banana, papaya, pineapple. So all we have the different system of uh, planting and we can achieve this. And this is the uh, uh, cashew crop. Again, it is uh, uh, planted high densely and it's rigorously trained and pruned continuously so so that we can achieve the targeted yield and this is a, a pruned orchard we now see that this is from the second year onwards we can go for the a continuous uh, training first in the from the first year onwards we are going to i mean the top the plant and allow the plant or push the plant to produce the very firm very strong branches two or three branches from then the third year we can and again we can cut this branch it can uh, going to produce uh, the uh, tree i mean the branches and this will be supported with uh, the drip uh, drip water continuously and also the required amount of fertilizers continuously supplied in a measured quantity so this is this technology it's it's really uh, uh, i mean the uh, it's a handy tool for the uh, farmers or grower who can produce more number of uh, uh, mangoes. So this is being adopted in many crops and particularly mango. You can see the profuse flowering of uh, uh, mangoes. So likewise, in, in, um, this is being followed in many crops and this is the cashew. Uh, cashew also is planted in um, either three by two meter or four by two meter. And you can see the uh, profuse flowering in the high density orchard. And you can see this is the mango orchard, uh, how uh, neatly it is uh, uh, trained, pruned regularly. And this is the uh, grape orchards. We can go for the continuous pruning. And another important thing is, so we have the different system of uh, pruning, thereby we can get at least two crops in a year, or we can go for five crops in two years. So this is a system is being followed in uh, Tamil Nadu, particularly in the Thane district, where the it's a predominant grape growing area and of course this is a different system of training uh, which normally we adopt it uh, for uh, different crops and the architectural management and here uh, one of the problem is uh, the old orchards in, in india uh, the mango is a very traditional crop where we have uh, plantations of 100 years, 50 years, even 200 year old plantations are there. So now all the estates become, all the plantations become senile. So now we want to retain the root system and uh, we can go for the uh, top working with the newer varieties or uh, choice varieties. So this technology is being followed. This otherwise called as rejuvenation or uh, uh, rejuvenation thereby the old orchards be uh, converted into new orchards. So this is a fantastic uh, uh, result one can adopt. So this is in the conventional system, we can able to adopt 100 trees per hectare. So from these 100 trees, we can get around seven tons of fruits. So this is the uh, originally what we receive is seven tons. Then we adopted the technology called high density planting. High density planting, we can able to accommodate nearly 400 plants per hectare. Hectare means two and a half acres. And there we can get 25 tons of fruits per year. You can see the difference between the 
uh, high density planting it is only seven tons and we have almost increased three and a half times so this is almost 350 percent increase in yield and by adoption adoption of the another technology the high density planting where we can able to accommodate almost uh, 1650 uh, plants per hectare and you see the uh, productivity uh, it is almost five times 500 times higher than the conventional method so this is the biggest so this is how we call it as the vertical production and productivity likewise in goa uh, normally the planting uh, this is around 400 plants per hectare we normally uh, plant in the high density system we are accommodating almost 2200 plants per hectare you can see the conventionally we can get around um, uh, 15 tons of fruits per hectare whereas here it's almost 40 tons almost a three time increase 300 percent increase in uh, productivity so this is how the new and innovative technology it works so and in vegetable crops we have demonstrated this technology now it is being followed uh, in almost in india this is the there are five parameters we are taken one is the uh, the production of healthy seedlings uh, that is a pro trade it is grown in a pro trade or it is almost like a, a machine made uh, seedlings almost uniform in size and we can adapt to the another important thing is hybrid varieties and we can go for the drip fertigation and uh, uh, the integrated pest and disease management so these five technologies besides another one important technology is called sisal plowing or drip irrigation i mean the deep plowing these five technologies implemented we almost double or uh, 200 to 300 percent increase in yield we have got because of this success of this and it is being uh, adopted almost throughout india and this is a technology so the drip fertigation and you can see you can uh, uh, go for, uh, use the machinery also for weeding spraying everything but only the uh, uh, harvesting is manual because we don't have a system of uh, mechanical harvesting uh, but the rest of the things weeding spraying everything can be done uh, mechanically almost in, in the case of uh, i mean banana uh, normally from one hectare uh, we can get around 35 to 40 tons but adopt adoption of this precision technology in banana production we achieved almost 120 tons per hectare so this is the biggest success likewise in all the crops we almost double the yield through this technology so next technology is the protected cultivation of course the protected cultivation we introduced from 90 uh, 97 onwards and now we have almost through the different system of uh, uh, subsidies from the government we are adopting this technology partially and now we have grown up to uh, many crops in this particularly uh, cucumbers are being cultivated tomato capsicum so all these are uh, doing this so in this what we are doing is of course the environment is protected and the climate is maintained and all these operations so fertilizer water everything is uh, precisely applied and we can get a, a decided our programmed yield we can get and this is a this is an inside view of the uh, greenhouse cultivation this is a cucumber tomato capsicum and this is cantaloupe so the our muskmelon and of course the entire thing is mechanized this is a high tech green greenhouses everything is programmed and we can program the yield also from one hectare of greenhouse we can we can harvest uh, nearly 300 to 400 tons of either tomato or capsicum in one year that is 10 to 12 months we can do it and likewise now we are introducing many crops into the the protected uh, cultivation and particularly the the high value crops the ginger turmeric all this also it can be grown in the protected cultivation where the lot of advantages are there when you grow the crop in the soils so it is tend to attacked by the so many soil bone fungus and bacteria when greenhouse technology or soilless culture where these basic problems of uh, soil fungus and the bacteria is eliminated thereby the production and productivity gets increased and another important thing is so we can 
supply the regulated level of water and the precise level of the nutrients which is required by the plant so that is more important for any crop husbandry programs and the next level of technology is the vertical farming technology so the vertical farming as i said uh, in the normal system say 1 hectare tomato open system we can grow 40 tons per hectare when you use the precision technology the four or five technology which i have uh, discussed so that is thereby we can increase to 100 to 120 tons and in the protected cultivation the automatic greenhouse and everything we can we can increase to 400 percent that is almost uh, 300 to 400 tons whereas this vertical farming or the hydroponics this is the latest system uh, this is in the uh, um, initial stage we can develop almost almost even 50 to i mean of uh, uh, around 100 tons one can expect from 1 hectare of uh, the uh, vertical farming unit so this is the, uh, the very important technology and of course this is an infant stage we need to standardize so many things and this uh, has lot of uh, scope in india in order to meet out the very growing demand in uh, for fruits and vegetables of course a lot of other advantages are there in the vertical farming we can reduce the space we can reduce the water usage efficiency water water requirement because water is going to be the uh, major problem in the future to come and now we can very limited water so we can grow the crop inside the uh, the greenhouse in the vertical farming system and this technology can be adopted in the nearby urban areas so that we can avoid the transportation cost of the Uh, fruits are vegetables uh, which is uh, which is a huge cost uh, nowadays we are incurring <coughs> and you see so almost in the when you compare the yield level of the normal farming the vertical farming we can produce almost 100% higher yield in the vertical farming system or hydro farming system and this is the um, uh, hydroponic system and uh, in the vertical farming of course hydro farming uh, hydroponic farming so both are similar so but only thing is uh, there we can use soilless culture also or water culture also here purely be water culture only it is used in the case of hydroponics and another important technique uh, this is the Uh, latest technique uh, which we uh, we have standardized uh, mainly for the uh, vegetables uh, particularly for uh, brunjal tomato chilli and uh, cucurbits uh, the particularly we can uh, go for grafted plants in the case of watermelon and the cantaloupe or the musk melon so why we are going for this technology normally we use this technology in the fruit crops or the long duration crops why we are going for this as i said the most of our yield reduction is mainly based on the the biotic stress or abiotic stress so particularly in the biotic stress the bacterial fusarium verticillium uh, phytophthora nematode these are the soil related organisms which almost it takes away or eat away all the plants it is in the loss is from 40% to even 100% in some worst cases so now we are we have the technology to resist say for example brinjal so we developed a one root stock uh, so this is from the solanum tarvum which can able to uh, give a resistance against the nematodes and another important thing is the uh, the wilt dry rot and it also incidentally it also resists against the root grubs so when one root stock takes care of the three problems three problem means not alone it it, it confine with the three problems and it is it, it is going to uh, use huge amount of pesticides fungicides bactericides to to arrest the growth of this organism so now we are reducing this huge volume of pesticide fungicide and bactericide uh, application by introduction of uh, a resistant root stock against disease 
So likewise, likewise we are developing root shocks against the problems, particularly the uh, salinity and the drought. These are the two problems uh, which we are encountering in uh, the tropical conditions. And these root shocks, I mean, serve as a, a, a what you call a resistant system for these problems by these vegetable grafting, we can increase the yield by, say for example, I'm telling the uh, Brinjal case, uh, we can able to produce almost 10 to 12 kg of fruits from a single plant in 12 months period. So normally Brinjal, uh, the longevity is around four to six months, whereas the grafted Brinjal can be kept uh, in, the, in the farmer's field almost 12 months. So 12 months, it's going to produce uh, a 12 kg of fruits. So that means, so nearly 100 to 120 tons of fruits can be harvested in 12 months continuously. So this is a biggest advantage for the farmer who can get the yeah, steady price in the market. Even if it up and down go, goes means he can, he can match the, he can uh, satisfy the loss when the prices goes up. So this is a very good technology. And uh, of course, we are keep on working this uh, this area, this is going to be a very promising uh, technology and it is going to solve many problems uh, in, uh, now and the future also. And this is, of course, I need not say anything about Moringa. So now it is become a worldwide uh, superfood. It is otherwise called as a superfood and uh, uh, the uh, otherwise called as it's a miracle tree on the earth because all the uh, leaf, fruit, then the flower, all contain almost 14 kind of vitamins and minerals. So this is very much needed for the human uh, system. Uh, this, so this is being called as worldwide. It is a super food and it's many forms. It is being um, uh, sold and uh, the our university is one of the pioneer university in releasing this uh, Moringa. Uh, PKM1 and PKM2, and this revolutionized the Moringa uh, production throughout the world. Throughout the world, I can say. So now almost the entire world, this particular variety is uh, being cultivated uh, for this purpose, either for leaf or for the um, uh, fruit. So now we are, we are in the, uh, almost we have standardized the technology for making the uh, tablets and also the powder and uh, uh, the Moringa oil from uh, Ben oil from the Moringa seeds, and this has the highest value in the international market. And this tablet, why I am stressing on this is I have told you in the hidden hunger, and hidden hunger is very well addressed by this uh, particular single crop Moringa, which contain a high amount of uh, nutrients. Uh, so now we are we are we have produced this. Uh, uh, Moringa tablet, and we plan to induce this uh, particular tablet in the noon meal scheme. So in order to prevent, in order to, uh, I mean, reduce the um, malnutrition problem in the uh, school children, as well as we are going to introduce in the, through the um, PHC primary health center to the lactating women. So both are vulnerable. They are deficient in the uh, calcium and iron. So this is rich in iron also and rich in calcium and phosphorus potassium also. So this is a very vital uh, uh, nutrient uh, which is required for uh, both the children as well as the lactate human. Of course, anybody can take, this is a revitalizer. This Moringa is a revitalizer, all can uh, take. But why we are going for this technology, either powder or the uh, tablet is, though we have a Moringa tree in the backyard, but we never care about the um, uh, tree because we, in the system of South Indian food, we can use this uh, green, but hardly we people uh, take. So that's why, so we are making into a different form so that they can take, because we, we are trying to take more tablets daily. So that's why, so we are making this tablet and this is going to be uh, serve the uh, purpose. And of course, in the years to come, uh, definitely the Moringa is going to, uh, minimize the uh, hidden hunger in our uh, uh, system, particularly in India. And I've uh, talked about these two varieties. 
the pkm means periya gulam periya gulam where i am now uh, so pkm one is a one muruga variety and pkm two is another muruga variety so the two varieties are released from this uh, institute and it is now worldwide it is being cultivated and there are lot of product also we are making out of it uh, so that it can be it can be given to a uh, different kind of people which can reduce the uh, the uh, malnutrition and another important technology we are aiming is uh, we almost the micro green cultivation so micro green is a newer technology which has uh, more nutrient than the adult one so we can grow this up to 15 days and take it's a, it's a mixture of different herbs different vegetables so we grow up to 15 days and we can take it as a salad or we slightly fry and eat so which gives a higher amount of uh, nutrient than the normal ones then of course uh, there is no need to i mean explain all these things spice as a functional food and the indian system of uh, cooking or indian system of food we almost one way or other we are using all these uh, spices uh, these spices contain lot of the uh, medicinal property uh, either antioxidant or carcinogenic and one of the important plant i mean the, the star anise which contains the antiviral property very very high amount so this is this is the most important of course bla black pepper this is good for the antiviral property so now many people are uh, taking this as a, a juice uh, i mean the boiled water uh, moringa ginger lime so this water uh, people are taking it and these are the very important uh, commodities uh, which can uh, help in eliminating the uh, hidden uh, hunger as well as the increasing the um, uh, immunity system in the human uh, life likewise there are many medicinal plants uh, which are in use and now we are i mean uh, there are so many medicinal plants and we have a very strong department uh, medicinal plants and we are uh, developing lot of uh, technology uh, to standardize and uh, i mean so far we are collecting the medicinal herbs uh, plant from the forest Uh, where it is uh, now uh, the restrictions are there so now we are standardized the technology uh, through i mean for cultivating these plants in a larger area because in the demand for these uh, medicinal plants for domestic use as well as the export it is getting increased day by day and finally i wanted to finally this is a final Uh, the antiviral property from medicinal plants and we are we are in the corona pandemic and there are number of plants which we already now we are in use the uh, andrographis uh, uh, paniculata this is being advocated for your uh, dengue fever and now this is also being recommended and there are lot of plants uh, herbal plants which contain antiviral property this we can use it and this is going to be a, a major player in the days to come now of course uh, we are being used the cinchona then these are the probable herbal plants so which can which can work against the the antiviral and also it gives the immune system i don't want to explain all the plants so with this i think uh, i am finishing my talk and we can save the nation through horticulture crop and horticulture crop be a corona warrior uh, so we can advocate and we can cultivate and we can uh, i mean uh, tell our advise our uh, young children and the uh, people to eat more fruits and vegetables so that we can develop the immunity inbuilt immunity in the system uh, which may work against the all hearts particularly the uh, corona virus like this with this i am uh, uh, finishing my talk thank you very much thank you very much for the organizers uh, who given me the chance to share my experiences share my thoughts uh, in the corona pandemic uh, period thank you very much thank you thank you dr arumugam sir you given very exhaustive uh, the lecture i hope 
uh, it's not a, a, a 20 minutes or one hour lecture. We can debate for, I mean, uh, many days. <clears throat> each, each, each slide can be of, uh, of uh, a session. We can talk about the very valuable information you are given. Uh, really, it is very useful to the present the COVID conditions, definitely. And you are given, a, a, I mean, a lot of information about the how the vegetable crops and the fruit crops can be effectively utilized uh, in this uh, crisis. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks thank a lot. And we have the the Dayanandasar University and uh, on behalf of the participants, uh, I'm very much thankful to you for giving a wonderful lecture on the other uh, uh, about the emerging trends in the, the horticulture, uh, including the horticulture, vegetable crops, etc. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have uh, uh, the, the last presentation uh, by Professor uh, Mrs. R. Ramani Bai. The former professor and director uh, from the Department of Zoology, University of uh, Madras, Chennai, and she is going to deliver of the the last one, which has been again a yeah, problem in addition to the pandemic COVID nineteen. Uh, we called as the locust. Uh, I think is a grasshopper family, and uh, and the title which have been. Uh, Madam would like to speak is the East Locust Swam, warning signal of the, the climate change. To introduce Professor Ramani Bai, she is a teacher, the researcher, the research supervisor, and mentor of more than 35 years of service. And basically, Madam is a zoologist from the University of Madras and see expertise covers all the, the zoological sciences like the hydrobiology, biodiversity conservation, and then tribal eco-health economy, capacity building, and uh, climate change. And these are some of the areas of uh, Madam's uh, the expertise. And uh, Madam has the prime assets uh, to the entire the scientific arena, especially for the biology groups. Uh, I would say that he is uh, patient for the projects he has done, a lot of projects. Not only that, Madam is also uh, been working in various uh, funding agencies as the, the member and who has granted many projects to the, especially for the, the women scientists. And then now she became an independent consultant uh, uh, with the tangible field operations. And Madam has an ample opportunity to work with prominent international universities of vast experience, including the CNRS laboratories. Uh, and I think Madam has visited many countries and still she is uh, contributing a lot to the, the scientific arena, especially in the area of the, the biodiversity and so on. Over to Madam, Professor Ramani Bai. Professor, Madam, I think you are not you are not audible. You are not audible. She has to unmute. Madam, you have to unmute. You have to unmute. Okay, sir. Now uh, can now you? Now it's sir? okay. Fine, fine. Okay, sir. Okay, madam, sir. 20, 20 minutes, Madam. Sir, no, I less than that, sir. I know the time crisis, sir. Yes, yes. yes. A uh, very good evening to all of you because it's already almost late. Of course, you have witnessed a very good, uh, nice presentation by Fruitful Fruits, their management and emerging technique in horticulture. So you have uh, three very best uh, good uh, um, uh, lecture, but without talking the prayer prayer, I don't think so. It will be com uh, complete the our whole session. So now it is my turn to talk about one of the predator or even prey. So very, uh, it, it will occur in swamps in our area. So when during the lockdown period, when we were inside, they were swarming around almost everywhere during uh, in the agricultural fields. So the, uh, whenever I we whenever we talk or say about uh, locust, 
So locust is already, I don't want to go into detail about the locust because all of you know it is a very big, very well-known predator, but otherwise it's known as short on grasshoppers. They are threat to agriculture. I think the three presenters and also others will accept how, how uh, damage this will cause to the agriculture fields. And I, of course, in due course of time, we, we won't be called these things as a, a grasshopper or a pest. <coughs> we may call this is a forerunner of bio wars. So in, we have recently become the prey for it, the food loss, because it is a voracious feeder. It feeds empty number, it, it, even it devastates even a small agriculture field. So coming to its taxonomy, let us briefly say, <coughs> it comes under the order Orthoptera, and also in it is accredited the group it comes around. <coughs> the grasshoppers in uh, so I already told you, excuse me. So it's uh, known as a ancient chewing herbivorous. It chews a lot, and also uh, it uh, I already told you it is a predator of cereals and pulses and vegetables. They, uh, and all recently also you might have seen in the uh, media also, <coughs> it has become a very good delicacy for the others to eat upon. Now you can see many cuisines are come across. So grasshoppers are generally solitary in nature some, and also they are gregarious. And also during this kind of thing, they exhibit polymorphism. You know, pretty well when we use the word polymorphism, they will adapt to different kinds of habits. So according to habits, the predator, they may change their color. So according to this, our locus, they will change their color from green to brown and brown to gray. And also even in sometimes they gray to <coughs> grayish brown in color. So they, I use the word swarm because they won't come all alone. They will not in groups, they'll come in very big swarms as it is. <coughs> For this swarming, serotonin levels, when they increase in their body, Serotonin triggers the or, or, uh, organism to move around, to swarm around, to roam around, and it affects the organism to go and feed and voraciously. So due to this high level of serotonin increase in the body level, they will attack, they will forage, they breed, and they will change the color also. So you cannot see, not even a single <coughs> grasshopper, but you will see only in swarms. So even a single swarm contains millions, millions of uh, grasshopper in its account. So you can now you can see the two color pictures. The solitary is a single one. It is not active. It is active only during night time and is specific to the food season. But the gregarious one are very active during the daytime. They eat voraciously. They are not food or diet specific. So initially we call, when they come in swarm, initially we call them as outbreak. When outbreak is more in number, then next level, next level we'll call them as upsurge. When upsurge are more level, we call this as a plague. So now at this level, we call them as a swarm or an outbreak of locusts. So let us at least at this stage, try to control the outbreak of locusts, which is foraging all our agriculture field in our area. So the history of locust sun, it start back in it, uh, 1875 because it's not a rare occasion. Now it has become very common outbreak of the locust. So locust uh, swarms has started even notice and also you can see in the books or even literature, it start back from 1879, always swarm because you can see the 12.5 trillion insects attack in a particular season and particular area in Europe. And in, in India also, from date back in 19, uh, 20th, early 20th century, they attacked in India also. And very, I, uh, I already told you, I, we never used the word occasion or rare and things. Now it has become frequently so occurring swarming in especially Rajasthan and Mah uh, Rajasthan area in North India. So it is because we wanted to know If we, want, we would like to know whether what triggers these locusts to come and occupy in our area. So we would like to know the fly pathway of the uh, grasshoppers because whenever the monsoon triggers out, their seasons, I think they started, generally they come 
from july to september very frequently do and attack all our agriculture field nowadays even you can witness during the month of april when the monsoon then uh, we have because the meteorological department they told yeah there is there will be a cyclone or storm during that time when monsoon triggers monsoon the onset of monsoon all the locust swarms they came around here and they devastated all our agriculture farms so Oh, we uh, so we should go and in and also we should get some data from meteorological department the pattern of the cyclone and how the cyclone moves then only we can able to predict or we can able to draw the flyway of the locus where it comes from where it comes from and what are the ways and what are the climatic condition which help them to uh, uh, settle in our areas so when we uh, uh, the biologists we would like to know the uh, you know, egg laying system of this locust so there are only the three development stage egg nymph and the adult within the 14 to 20 days all the adult of all the egg uh, or nymphs will become adult so they are within a very short duration of time you can see a full swarms of uh, locust in our area so what uh, the biologists they think so instead of uh, uh, controlling or applying control measures when they become adult we thought we, why don't we control at least the uh, the development stage at the nymph stage or even at the egg stage when the eggs are laid in the inside the agriculture field and the sand or sediment particle why don't we control we destroy all the eggs in that area in that stage itself when we uh, uh, control all the uh, um, uh, egg, uh, hatching out eggs when we arrest the development stage of this locus i, I think uh, i I'll, i'll think we can able to at least arrest the uh, swarming in or migratory or blooming in of the population of this locus so in india i already told you we saw an abnormal cyclone during the uh, year 2019 and also during the april month of 2020 so indian cyclone season and iod condition lead to severe rain flood when there is a rainfall when there is onset of monsoon immediately you can see all the locusts are come out from their hives and also they will come and swarm in and around the fields or even agriculture fields so the iod and locust migratory pattern should be drawn out and also a, a in depth study has to be taken along with the iod and the locus migratory pattern then only we can able to advocate or employ or deploy all our control measures to control or to arrest the locus swarm in our area so coming to the control measures there are various control measures available the control mechanical control measures and biological control measures they use uh, motorized control measures so uh, even chemical control measures so you know pretty well about when we apply the chemical control measures we know we should be very careful before advocating any pesticide into the field you know the side effects and the causes do, uh, will be caused to the other agriculture um, products so we should be very careful when we apply the control measures so the only or the best thing may be the biological method i'm using you can also release the enemies or predators or prey of the locust in that particular area to go and orage the field either the nymphs or either the uh, eggs or in the early stages of the locust so the i am um, uh, what we suggest instead of going for chemical method uh, spraying of chemical insecticide we can use natural predators i think uh, the biological control measures may be very useful at the early stage where we can arrest the um, uh, propagation or more number of locusts in our area so when we when we work for our mosquitoes maybe we are working on mosquito aedes mosquitoes in our area so what we thought the biological enemies or biological predators are more useful to control aedes aegypti mosquito at the at their early larval stages so we what we thought maybe that uh, method useful to control the locust in our area when we uh, deploy more number of biological enemies to control the locust at the early stage that i think uh, that will be more useful for that and also government should take some other plans to work the locust uh, control what i thought 
the locust has given us a wake up call a early warning signal to us so we should prepare ourselves so the early warning system should be predicted using the iod data and using the climatic condition data and along with the uh, geologists as well as the agriculture scientists we, i thought we can at least give some preparedness to the farmers to prepare themselves before the onset of the locust swarming in a very large quantity where they are going to occupy almost all the agricultural field so and also the migratory pattern so far we don't have a uh, very good or very exact migratory pattern of these locusts where they are coming from and what what triggers for them to come over to india and to pakistan we do not know which triggers so we so far we have predicted cyclones onset of monsoon or the two are the major uh, causes for this uh, locust to come in to fly over here in very big swarm and also nowadays we are using even for this covid we use the drones i think when we deploy drones we can able to arrive at a conclusion the migratory patterns the flyaway patterns of these uh, locusts where they are coming out whether the drones and also even through drones we can deploy some biological uh, predators to do, uh, at least to deploy some uh, prey or predators in particular area to go and attack the locusts in when they were in their early stages so even uh, i am uh, what are our suggestion is so the best method to can be use is biological control method using drone and also we can at least give some early warning system to the farmers so the, the this uh, Uh, alarming signal by the locust and which has given us a wake up call for us we have we should wake up at this stage because we do not know when the next swarm of locust will come and attack all our agriculture field especially in the north india and also uh, the some data is given thus it has al already leached e even ap area we do not know when they, when they will come to our area our previous uh, present uh, dr t arumugam has given nicely projected almost all the greenery green uh, agri horticulture fields to us so we want to protect our fields in uh, not infested by this locust in our area so the main cause for this locust we should know we should arrive at and also we should give some early warning system we should be prepared well prepared well prepared before the onset of the locust of the swarm so um, um, based on our work related to this mosquito aedes mosquito what we suggest biological control method may be one of the best method to control locusts and also deploying the drones to know the migratory pattern and also fly away uh, route of these locusts is very very important so i think only briefly i will explain this thing because of the short of time time and also i should thank the organizer who have given me a, a very good opportunity to share my thoughts because i explain only the biology the climatic condition and the control measure to combine this because your data um, everywhere because so far not an individual group uh, um, um, delivered a very in depth data towards the locust swarm and their flyway and it is uh, many avenues are there for the young researcher to take up to work in this area and they again come up with a very good control measures without affecting other agriculture um products and agriculture field are not affect to the uh, you know, ecosystem terrestrial ecosystem as well as aquatic ecosystem thank you very much for your patience sharing thank you very much for the opportunity given to me thank you very much thank you one and all thank you madam thank you so much i think you have given a very comprehensive information about the the locust again i say that it is one of the menaces uh, to the present uh, the scenario of the covid situation i think you have given a wonderful solution that uh, the biological control the biological control is the only method to eradicate the problem and the menace of these locust uh, you have mentioned thank you so much madam very informative uh, i think uh, this is the, the last the session of this concluding remarks uh, i think today i think in the international webinar on the covid 19 the situation the scenario we have focused on the reinventing sustainable agriculture to achieve the 
food security. We have uh, four uh, the lectures. And the first one is the keynote speaker, Professor Dr. David Neary. Uh, he has mentioned about the sustainability in the area of the fruit production. And he mentioned a lot of avenues are available in the fruit production during this situation. And also he has given the caution that what should be done for the, the future, adopting the various agriculture practices, uh, in, especially in the, uh, the European conditions. And also he has mentioned about the uh, lot of avenues available for the export of the economy uh, from the various fruit culture, uh, etc. is mentioned. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. David Neary, for your excellent presentation. And on behalf of the organization committee, and we wholeheartedly thank you for your uh, the valuable time you have I mean, given, and then uh, you interacted with all of our uh, the participants here from uh, Greece to India, and then America to India. You have a lot of participants from there. And thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. David Neary. My heartfelt care, thanks to our doctor. And next, uh, the presentation is by our the Iran, uh, the researcher, Dr. Arash uh, Goshwari. And uh, he, I think he mentioned a lot about the, the, the new area of the technology. Uh, he mentioned the technology is the only the solution for the, the farming system, especially for the olive production, he mentioned. And then also he has given a very innovative idea of the how the fruit growth can be determined and, and uh, can be analyzed with reference to the, the oleic acid and other the contents of the olive oil present in the, uh, the fruit. And you mentioned, and then I, I think my heartfelt thanks goes to the young researcher. I think you spared your valuable time with us and you interacted with us. Really, we are very much thankful to you for your the excellent presentation. Thank you so much, our, Dr. Arash. Thank you. Next, our third presentation is by our Professor uh, Dr. T. Armugam uh, and the Dean of the Horticultural College from the South India, uh, which is also again one of the college under the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. And I think he has given a very exhaustive uh, the presentation about uh, the various farming system and then the practices and then pruning system with reference to the all the horticulture, uh, especially the, the tropical fruits. Uh, and then also he's mentioned about the, what is the current need of the medicinal plants for the virus. I think he has mentioned about the various the constant, how the phytoconstituents also can be helpful to eradicate the virus, the infections uh, to the humankind. He mentioned, I think he has a wonderful lecture he has given. So on behalf of the organization committee, and on my behalf, I wholeheartedly thank you, sir. Thank you for your excellent uh, the lecture you have given. And uh, thanks a lot uh, for valuable time you have, I um, mean, in, in this evening you have spared with us. And the fourth speaker is the again, Professor Madam Ramani Bai. In fact, I have given only a very short notice to prepare for this uh, locus because it's a very interesting area. And we would like to know that what is the cash we need for the, the future agriculture, the practices, because we know that a lot of the pests and diseases will normally have a problem to the our challenges to the Indian agriculture. And this is one again, which needs a greater attention and challenge. And Madam has prepared, I think a thorough note of the, the locust and he mentioned about what is the solution for the, uh, the menace of this. And I think she mentioned that the biological control with the, uh, the tone is the only the solution can be uh, in, in a year we can um, and adopt and then we can eradicate the menace of those problems. So I think all the four lectures are very, very interesting. And almost uh, we have, uh, I'm telling you more than thousand participants have been registered, more than thousand participants. This is the first time that we had, uh, I mean, over welcome the, the participants for this uh, the important seminar on the reinventing sustainable agriculture. So heartfelt thanks to all the speakers who have spared your valuable and precious time with us for the uh, the international seminar and also thanks to all the participants and the north to south and we have a friend from kashmir kashmir to kanyakumari we have and then also we have the international 
uh, the participants who joined with us from Greece, I could see that. And a lot of uh, the international, I mean, participants have been uh, assembled in the, in the webinar. Uh, thanks to all the participants for this important event. And then I would like to inform you here, the E certificates, the E participation certificates will be sent to all the participants who have gathered today and it will be sent via your email. You can retrieve and then you can download, you can use it for your the memory, memory of our international the seminar. And uh, my heartfelt thanks to the, my own team, the technical team under the, the head of the uh, Ms. Deepa and then the Mr. Ali and Mr. Uh, the, the Imias, Mohammed Imias and Madam, so all the technical group have been helped day, uh, day and night uh, to make this function, yeah, the webinar as a grand success. So my heartfelt thanks to all the participants. We will, again, I could see that um, most of the process for even from the Punjab, the Guru Nanak Dev University are here. And then uh, the doctor, Mr. Murugan is here. And uh, Bharat Singh is here from Kashmir. Jammu, Sivakumar. So I could see a lot of uh, the friends from the various parts of the country. I could see that. So thanks to all and uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Uh, goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.